This is Listen St. Louis with Carol Daniel. When I think about the critical issues facing black and brown residents in the St. Louis area, I often ask the questions, how did we get here? What's holding us back? And how do we progress? At 9 PBS, we want to deepen our understanding and change the narrative. Join me as I look for answers and discover solutions on today's podcast. Psychology Today reports that African Americans face the highest rate of post-traumatic stress disorder of any group. What is the impact on one's health, relationships, and the economy due to unresolved, untreated trauma, such as childhood abuse, hunger, illness, or violence in the lives of far too many black people? My guest today is a therapist and founder of CHAOS, which stands for Keep Healing and Overcoming Struggles. Dr. Candace Cox joins me next on Listen St. Louis with Carol Daniel. Listen St. Louis with Carol Daniel is supported in part by Midwest Bank Center, the Betsy and Thomas Patterson Foundation, and Orvin and Latrice Kimbrough. Welcome back to another episode of Listen St. Louis with Carol Daniel. Thank you so much for coming alongside us, for listening to these podcast conversations, because we believe here at 9PBS that it is time to change the narrative, change the story that we tell ourselves about ourselves. And the one way to do that is through clarity an increase in information and awareness. And that's what we are trying to accomplish. We think we have. We think we're doing it here at Listen St. Louis. And so you need to be a part of this, though. You need to share the podcast. Don't keep all this goodness to yourself. Share it with people you know would benefit from the conversation. Be interested in the conversation. And subscribe, because we have goals here. I like to let my bosses know that, yes, it's actually working. People are actually listening. And one way that that is known is by increase in subscribers. So do hit that subscribe button. Just touch it, and then you become a subscriber. And then leave us a comment. I love to read your comments. Um, I read one yesterday, and they just said, this is valuable information. So that tells us we are on the right path. Thank you again for joining us on Listen St. Louis with Carol Daniel. And my guest today is I would call her a friend. I don't know what she calls me, but I call her a friend, and I stalk her all the time on Facebook. (laughs) I listen and read everything she is saying. Dr. Candace Cox, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate you. So you got the chaos working. Yes, always. I say I rock the brand like Nike. You have to. Rock the brand. It's important. What does chaos stand for? Chaos, K-H-A-O-S, stands for Keep Healing and Overcoming Struggles. And so it is a shift on the regular chaos, C-H-A-O-S, which mm-hmm. I say is can't help acting out severely. Mm. Mm-hmm. So keep. Uh-huh. So uh, what I wanted to talk to you about today, and, and when we first launched this podcast, you were one of the, when I wrote down a dream list of guests, you were on that list. Well, thank you. Bye. Because you and I first met, I don't know how many years ago that was, that you were at... A bar, yes, and, bar grill, and grill, barcode yes. and grill in Saint <laughs> yes. Anne. Yes, and my 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 a colleague of mine said she found it on Facebook, and mm-hmm. there's there's this bar in Saint Anne, and they are having on Sundays, I believe it Let's was, talk. it may still be, mm-hmm. um, where they bring therapists in, mm-hmm. black therapists, yes, black owned bar and grill, yes, and people put their questions in a fish bowl, yep. At a bar. Yes. So that, I met you at that bar. Yes, ma'am, you did. And that was, I think almost, it was before COVID. It was way before COVID. Yes, it was before COVID. And so like, we still do it. We just do it like every other month now instead of monthly. But um, it's six therapists. We come together. We come to a place because Barcode and Grill, we call it like the black cheers. That's where people go. And the thought process is, if a lot of people go to bars and they go to the bartenders and they talk to them mm-hmm. and those are their counselors, how about we get some real counselors how in the about, bar? How about? You know, and what we do is on on that Sunday, we get uh, the owner, said Powell, he gets food and different things like that, coffee, juice and things. And then we have the fishbowl and it's all anonymous. And we answer those questions and we open the conversation, create a safe space for us to heal and grow together. We as black people are just now, it seems, embracing Mm -hmm. or even just approaching 
the notion that we are not mentally well. Yes, yes. And, you know, my thing, you know, with chaos is all about urbanizing mental health and mental wellness. Mm -hmm. You know, making people understand that if you're not mentally well, you're mentally ill. Just the same, though, as if you're not physically well, you're physically ill. And so we have to change that in our mind to think that one is worse than the other. You know, that I understand that if I'll go to a dentist for my teeth, if I'll go to an eye doctor for my eyes, it's okay for me to go to a therapist for my mind. Same difference. But it's not in our minds. It's still not okay. Mm -hmm. And even more so for black men. Yes. What is what? How do we address that stigma? Because it is a stigma. Oh, it definitely is, and that's the reason why you know, like again, with chaos, we work toward you know reducing the stigma to help you understand that just the same as you've learned how to work with your physical health, you got to work on your mental health as well. You think about it. In school, we learned how to read, we learned how to write, we learned how to play sports, maybe even instruments. But when it came down to our mental health, when we didn't respond to something the way that it we were supposed to, air quotes, respond, we were punished for it. And so if you never learned how to deal with your emotions, you can't do what you don't know how to do. And so recognizing that if I never learned how to do this, let me learn how so I can be the best version of me. Most of the time, especially with our black men, they've been surviving. Mm -hmm. And they don't even know what it feels like to be happy, healthy, and thriving because they've just been surviving. And that's not fair to them. And so, you know... Black men, if you're listening, I need you to understand mm. that it's not fair to you to just survive. You deserve to do more than just wake up to go to sleep. That's not fair to you. Mm. Mm. It's not fair to them. Yes. And in that very statement is compassion and caring and awareness that black men just have, have never received. No, because most of the time you've been told, man up. Yeah. You've been told, you know, don't cry, suck it up. But... What does that mean? You know, and even with black women, when we talk about you got to be strong, I tell us all the time, baby, strong don't mean you hold on until you break. Mm. That's not it. You know, we are not a piece of iron. We are human beings. And so, therefore, it's okay for you to address the things that hurt you so that you can be, again, the best version of you. You deserve that. You deserve it. I know that, that there are those who bristle when we bring up race and racism, mm -hmm. but we've been, we've had a conversation about racism, but we've only are just now beginning to have a conversation about mental health and racism. Yes. Yes. Because, you know, I specialize in intergenerational and environmental trauma. And so when we think about the things that have happened to us intergenerationally, as a result of just who we were, you know, those and how we were treated and how we were treated. Mm -hmm. Those things have lasting impact. I've no, I don't know if you've ever read the book Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome. No, I have not, but I know and the book. So, yeah. And so that book talks about just the small things that we as black people do, how the difference between how a, a white person may allow their kids to roam the store, but we hold ours close to us. You know what I'm saying? Just something small like that because we don't want nothing to happen to you. It's the fear. And we, as black people, we have what we call hypervigilance. Mm -hmm. It's a universal thing. It's, it's hypervigilance where we are on guard always. We are always waiting for the other shoe to fall. We're always wondering what's going to happen. You ask almost any black person to go somewhere, first thing they're going to say, who's going to be there? <laughs> First thing is universal because I need to know if I'm going to have a problem with somebody, mm -hmm. what the issues can be. It is we we have that in us and we don't talk enough about epigenetics, which is which epigenetics um, are the genetic markers that lay on top of our genes. And so when we talk about slavery and racism and things like that and how we say that it's been passed down through the generations, it has been because through epigenetics, it's the coding of our genes. And so when certain things happen it sends the code to our genes to do whatever is genetically inside of it coded to do so when we deal with certain things that our ancestors dealt with and we deal with something similar to it now it's coded in us to respond a certain way it literally is passed down it's clear 
to me that when you say hypervigilance, mm-hmm. my mind goes to war veterans and PTSD. And yes. that's when we first began to talk about hypervigilance yes. was after so many soldiers coming back from particularly the Iraq war. Yes, yes. And you have to think about it. When you, you know, like I talk a lot about toxic and traumatic stress, you know, so when you are living in a high amount of toxic and or traumatic stress, that means that I don't feel physically and or emotionally safe. And think about it as a as a black person or a person of color. How often Mm. do we not feel physically Mm -hmm. and or emotionally safe just because of the color of our skin? Mm -hmm. And, and, And I will say that it does not matter economic status no it doesn't because it don't matter if you have if you have eight figures we won't even say seven you can have eight figures or you can have two dollars in your pocket you still (laughs) Mm -hmm. based off of the way that you look can deal with the same type of issues and that right there is a problem I remember my my husband we've lived in our current home for 12 years now and when we first moved in we you know, you had to bring people in because there were things that were wrong. And uh, a gentleman came in to fix the refrigerator door, which was delivered dented. Mm-hmm. And he, my husband answered the door. And this is a very nice house mm-hmm. in a very nice neighborhood mm-hmm. is because we have achieved. Mm-hmm. Right. And so my husband answers the door. The man looked him up and down <laughs> and, and said, and I'm paraphrasing, um, what do you do mm. to, to, to my, now you here to, you are here to do a job, to do you. a job. Please. And thank you. Mm-hmm. Okay. And you were sent here to do this job and you not even in the house yet. So we did come in and my husband who was in the military and is mechanically inclined, he knows a thing or two, he mm-hmm. can fix a thing or two mm-hmm. and was asking the man, Whatever. Mm -hmm. And he gave him sarcasm and my husband threw him out of the house. Please and thank you because you got to go. Threw him out of the house. Mm Now, I, I, the notion that you've done everything right Mm -hmm. that society says you should do. Mm -hmm. We're educated. We are achievers. Mm -hmm. We are, we're married. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We's married now. We We are living the American dream. We are living the dream. And yet you servant man can yes. come into my house and still look down on and me. still look down on me and question mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. question yes because do i deserve this or not and yes. who are you mm-hmm. and that within itself has a bearing because that is still this happened and your husband took the steps but it's still the sit back and i still got to process that this happened that this happened yes and oftentimes and i say it many of us are on autopilot so we don't process. We just keep moving forward. And so we don't ever think about the impact or I say the emotional casualties right. that we endure as a result of the things that happen to us. And you've said several times feeling safe yes. is a part of mental well-being. Yes. And that in general, as black people, in general, mm-hmm. OK, because some of y'all are safe. You mm-hmm. behind gated communities. Mm-hmm. You're safe. Mm-hmm. Even though I remember Chris Rock saying In his neighborhood, his next door neighbor is a dentist. Mm -hmm. Chris Rock's next door neighbor is a dentist. Now, let that let that soak. Yeah, let Mm -hmm. that sink in a little bit. Um, So some of y'all are safe. You feel safe. But Mm -hmm. most most do not. Thanks. So what is mental well-being versus healing? And so you have, there's a definition for mental wellness. Okay. And so the definition for mental wellness is there's four things. One, um, you're able to recognize your own ability. Um, Two, you are able to work productively and fruitfully. Um, Three, um, you are able to cope with everyday things that happen. And four, you are able to give to your community. And so that is the definition hmm. for 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 being mentally well. Listen, St. Louis, I, I, I've never yes. heard. Yes, we yes. talk about mental well-being yes. all the time. Yes. And so those are those are that. If you look up mental wellness, okay. and that will be the four things that come okay. underneath it. And so it's like, okay, it sounds easy, but then when you think about what are the ways that you cope with certain things, and so yes, I may be able to focus on the things that I am able to do. I can do that. 
But then you put me into a dynamic where there are insecurities that come in, where there's anxiety that comes in, where there's depression that comes in. Then I may I may be very good at my job and can usually work fruitfully and productively. But then there's barriers that stop me from being able to be the best version of myself. Or I may give to my community, but I'm a fawner. And so I'm giving to my community, but I'm not taking care of myself. I'm giving to everybody else and putting myself on the back burner. So it's like you have to look at those things, but you also have to look at, am I am I doing these things because I am the best version of me or am I doing them because there are some ways that I am coping in a maladaptive way? Or are there things that I am doing this as a way to protect me and I really am not set in stone in these four areas? Hello, church busyness. It's, hmm, that's called, so you know you got four ways. If a person has a high amount of toxic and or traumatic stress or they've been traumatized and or, there's four things that we can do. Fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. And so F A W N fawn fawn F A W N okay fawn. okay and so your fighters your fighters are your people where at some point in your life something happened to you and when it happened to you you either had to fight physically and or verbally or you couldn't and so now you got it in your mind it ain't gonna happen to me again and nobody gonna do that to me again mm. and so you become that I'm gonna get you before you get me person. And Ooh. so you be that person Girl, that you, I'm going. Why? 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 <laughs> why are you so that, all that, in my house? Go I, ahead. Go I ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. But so that's your fighter. And so your fighter is usually your person that sometimes can sabotage relationships because they they see things through what I call stained glass windows. So they they see it through their experience. And so what they when they get into it with people, they the people that they're into it with don't have the information that they have. So those are we your don't fighters. know why. Right. Why are know, you a fighter? I don't know why you flipping out like that. Yeah. But you but you as the fighter feel like they 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 trying to come at me crazy. So I'm going to get them before they get me. I got to protect me. Now, that was me in my teens, by the and way. So, Let hey, me just that was me. That was me in my <laughs> teens and early 20s as well. <laughs> and so then you have your fleers. Your fleers are your people where at some point in your life something happened to you and you don't sit in it. You don't acknowledge it. You run from it. You avoid it. And so your fleas are your people that smoke it away, drink it away, mm. work it away, exercise it away. Is that more likely to be black men? That those are a lot of times your people that are engaged in all these different things, but they don't sit in anything. They avoid. You say something to them about it, they act like you ain't said nothing to them. They may, they may even go over what you didn't said. Or sometimes it's our overachieving women that are mm. doing everything. They overachieving, and but they don't never stop to see what's happening. They dealing with what's going on with you, but they house on fire. Mm. And they ain't paying attention to their house on fire across the street because they too busy making sure that you're taken care of. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then you got your your uh, freezers. And your freezers are your people where something happens and I can't run from it. So I got to go. I got to sit and I got to endure this. But I disassociate. And so those are your people a lot of times are black men. That they are kind of on autopilot just waking up to go to sleep and they're not connected to anything. That's where you hear you act like you don't care. You act like mm. you don't this. You act like you don't that. Because how can I be connected to you when I'm not even connected to myself? And then that was why I say you waking up to go to sleep. But then you got your fawners. And your fawners are your people where at some point in your life something happened to you and possibly the people that were supposed to have you, they didn't. And so they 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 dropped you in some way. Mm. And so now you got it in your mind that that ain't going to happen. I'm never going to put myself in anybody's hands again. And so you be the I'll do it. I'll take care of it. I got it. I ain't going to ask nobody for nothing. I do it. But then you may even become a people pleaser. But also what happens is the 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 people that you love, you hold them close. And you want to make sure that they are all taken care of. And you go above and beyond to make sure that they're good. But... Without realizing it, sometimes you teach those people how to use you. Mm. Yeah. And so my name is Candace. I'm a recovering fighter, freezer, <laughs> and fawner. My name is Carol. I'm a recovering fighter, mm -hmm. for sure. Yes. For sure. Recovered yes. fighter, for sure. Yes. And so in the black community, because poverty is what it is, yes. um, and because racism is what it is, how have we, how are we showing up? Now, because of those 
very real socioeconomic impacts. You see it. You see it in our babies. You see how angry they are. You see how impulsive they are, how they are. They're just, they are on autopilot. Our babies out here just living. You know, you see it in our parents because they're disconnected. A lot of our parents are frozen and they're disconnected. And so like they are, they're just going through the motions. And sometimes these babies are raising themselves. You see it when you go to quick trip and you see somebody trying to uh, jump somebody else. And it's a fight that break out because, oh, you you trying to do this. So I, I got to get you before you get me. You know, you see the scarcity mentality. Mm-hmm. So I'm, 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 I'm taking to make sure that I got all of it when you get to the root of it is people don't feel physically and or emotionally safe. So I'm doing what I got to do to survive, but I don't even know what it feels like to thrive. And you have gone into, I know, because I mentioned stalking you on Facebook, um, you've gone into the criminal justice system. Why did you choose to do that? And and what are you doing? And so that is my favorite contract that I have. Mm. And I get to go into the jails twice a month and I get to teach the inmates the chaos mindset. And so what I do is I teach the inmates about toxic and traumatic stress. I teach them about the four responses that I just talked about. I teach them about adverse childhood experiences, which is a list of 10 things. And if you have four or more of those things happen to you between zero and 17, it changes you mentally, physically, and has the ability to reduce your lifespan. And then I teach them the chaos mindset, which is what I've created um, to help individuals learn how to assess, address, and reduce the impact of toxic and traumatic stress in their lives. My main thing is when I go in there in every group that I talk to, I let them know there is nothing wrong with you. Mm, Say it again. There is nothing wrong with you, but there is quite a possibility that there are some things that have happened to you throughout the duration of your life, and they have changed you and the way that you interact with the world around you. So let's look at what happened to you. How did it change you? And then let's learn how to create a new normal. And within that, though, and I want to talk about those 10 things Mm -hmm. that that may have happened to you in childhood. Yes. And if there are four or more. Mm -hmm. Right. But within what you've just said, society has to come to the point that we look at a certain population Mm -hmm. and ask that very question Mm -hmm. rather than which is what has always been the case in certain political parties Mm -hmm. that let us institutionalize you Mm -hmm. because you are a threat. Yes. But what we do in all honesty, think about it when you go back to school, like I said earlier, we have been punishing people for being in pain. You know, we've been punishing people for being depressed. We've been punishing people for having PTSD. We've been punishing people instead of at no point have we ever taught people how to deal No point. But we've been punishing them because their reaction to survival looks different than what we would want it to look like. What are those 10 things you mentioned that may? And that's a that's a long list. But and so here it is. And I want you to know, as I say these, as you're listening, it is a possibility that you can be triggered. And if you're triggered, I need you to take a deep breath. Seven in, hold it, seven out and remind yourself that you are not in that space any longer. Okay. And so here it is. Physical abuse. Were you physically abused between 0 and 17? I'm not talking about spankings. I'm talking about physically abused, hit with objects, like those types of things. Were you verbally abused? Did anybody call you outside of your name? They called you dumb, lazy, stupid, fat, ugly, things like that. Emotional abuse. Did you not get the hugs and the kisses and the I love you's and you can do it and I believe in you's, the nurturing that you that you needed when you were between zero and 17? Sexual abuse. Were you exposed to sex in any way? And it doesn't just necessarily mean penetration. It means were you forced to touch people? Did people touch you? Were you forced to watch things or be in anything that triggered things sexually inside of you and you weren't ready to deal with that? Neglect. Did you not have your basic needs met? Did you not know where you were going to sleep, what you were going to eat? Did you not have hot water? Did you not have food? Did you not, were you not registered in school or did nobody pay attention to you being in school? Did you not have clean clothes or clothes that fit? Or did you not go to the doctor when you needed to go to the doctor? Domestic violence. Did you 
uh, grow up in a house where there was domestic violence, where there was a lot of yelling and screaming or fighting? Did you have to help fight or did you have to see the aftermath of it? The house all messed up or the the bloody lips and the and the, the uh, broken things around the house or the black eyes or different things like that. Did you grow up in a household where there was someone addicted to drugs and or alcohol? And that is if somebody was maybe there, you had a parent that was there, but they were always high. So they weren't really present or maybe they weren't there because they were out chasing the high or they were taking things in the house and you didn't have the things that you needed in your house. You couldn't keep anything or and they were addicted to alcohol. And so maybe they would drink and if they would drink, they would spend up the money in the household or they they got mean and they would would say mean things or would want to fight or break things in the house or cause problems within the home or do things that were harmful when they were drunk, but didn't remember when they when they weren't. Did you have anybody that was close that was incarcerated? They were in and out of jail or they went to jail 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, never coming home again. Did you have a parent that was mentally and or physically ill? And so you may have had a parent that had functional depression. So therefore they were there, they was in the house, but they were, they, they went in a room and isolated themselves. Or you had a parent that maybe had a chemical imbalance or they may have dealt with post-traumatic stress disorder and you didn't know. And so they were good one day, but you got in trouble the next day for something you did the day before. You couldn't gauge it. Mm -hmm. Or they, eggshells. you know, right. You walking on eggshells or they were physically ill. They may have been on dialysis or something and you had to take care of the household because they couldn't. You had to grow up before your time. Or the last one, did you grow up with the loss of a parent where due to death, abandonment or divorce or separation, did you have... Uh, 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 a parent that one was there, but the other one wasn't. Maybe you had a parent that passed away or maybe you grew up and big mama raised you or your auntie or somebody raised you or you was in foster care. Those are the 10. I got five. Mm -hmm. And so, again, if you got four or more of those things, I need you to know it ain't nothing wrong with you. But there are some things that happen to you and you got to go back and figure out how did I change because of what happened to me? And then what do I want to do with it going forward? Because you are not your trauma. It -hmm. is a part of what happens to you. But happiness, healing and peace are inside jobs. Mm -hmm. So you got to be willing to do the work to be the best version of you. There are so many walking around who... At this point, looking at that list, hearing Mm -hmm. that list, do not know who they are. Yeah, because you are who you've been created to be. Mm -hmm. So you got to get back to the core of you. That's why I say you got to unlearn the things that you were taught were right or unlearn the things that you learned to survive and relearn new ways of doing things. That's why chaos is keep healing and overcoming struggles because life is a journey. And it's going to happen to you until the day that you leave this world. So you have to continue to heal and overcome the struggles. But oftentimes what we do is we just overcome the struggle, but we leave out the healing part. Mm. And what does that even look like? How, how does one overcome the struggle but leave the healing behind? And so what you do is that's when those trauma responses kick in. That's uh, when you start. That's when you just move past it and you act like ain't nothing happened. Right. But then those residual things come mm-hmm. up. And so we, you know, uh, we operate 90 percent from our subconscious and 10 percent from our conscious. And so that means that 90 percent of the things that we do are based off of things that have already happened. And so we're creatures of habit. We're creatures of pattern. And so if we are presented with something that looks similar to something that we've already did whatever we did then we're going to do again it may look a little different but we're Mm going to do it because it's a pattern but if it was dog trash the first time it's going to be dog (laughs) trash the 719th time you do it and so with chaos we have a skill called raw which is realize admit and work through so once you realize the issue, then you have to admit what's your role in it. Mm-hmm. And then how is it impacting you? And then that work, that's when you unlearn and relearn. That work is create a new normal. But then you have to do it with intention. Question yourself on why you do what you do. Because most of the time it's just out of pattern. 
attention. Be aware of who and what you're giving your attention to because you are a product of your environment. And then attitude. If the things that you are intentional about and the places and spaces and people you're giving your attention to impact you negatively, then you got to do something different. What has the over-incarceration of particularly black men Mm -hmm. done for mental well-being and for healing it has if you know it doesn't you know people go in and you supposed to come out rehabilitated that's not the case at all and no and so what's happening is people are becoming institutionalized and then when you put them back out into the real world you got these these men women that have been in this institution in this space this control space still stuff happening to them within this space and then you put them out here into the world and the anxiety is high And I don't know how to deal. I'm overstimulated. And so I flip out in spaces where people feel like I should be calm Mm. or I got or I'm easily triggered. And I don't even know what my triggers are. And so I respond in an overreactive way to something that you feel shouldn't even be that. I can't I don't know how to have relationships with my children because I've been gone for so long. And that's a healing process within itself. Right. You know, and so like those things, because we don't deal with those things, then I am going to re offend. I'm going to do something different. And a lot of times I've talked to some inmates that have been in jail on and off throughout their whole life. They be like, it's easier in here than it is out there. Mm. You hear that all the time. I hear it often. Yes. I just met a lady yesterday. That baby is, she's 62 years old. And she says she's been in and out of jail since 1987. Since 1987. And when I hit her with those aces, she broke down. She, she said, I'm not crazy. I said, baby, you not crazy. I said, but since you were a little girl and you 62 now, Since you were a child, she said the first thing happened to her when she was like seven or eight, she was sexually abused. So from seven to 62, you've never known what it felt like to be safe. So you've been surviving, protecting yourself, defensive, fighting all these years. Yeah. And so we are in a society, in a country Mm -hmm. that... I remember this, calling my health care provider, looking for a therapist, Mm -hmm. and they said, well, we'll fax you a list, Mm -hmm. because that's how long ago this was. Mm -hmm. They'll fax you a list of area providers. And I said, well, what, then what? And they they said, well, you then call Mm -hmm. and see who is available. This is 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I called maybe five on the list, and... Four of them left messages. They don't call. They didn't call back. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm making the point that our system of health care is broken. Is broken, and even when one tries, they still don't get what they need. So they and, quit. and I, I've always had health care, so that puts me right because you got the many of those that don't even got that. Don't have that mm-hmm. right, and so then I go into a system. That you're going to get seven sessions. It's more now. Uh huh. Yes, they got the EAP. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it's ten now. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, so it's grown a little bit. But the system is broken. So how then, as black people who generally do not have health care, who generally are looking at the stigma of it all, trying, knowing some something's not right. Mm-hmm. I'm not okay. I'm not okay. Mm-hmm. And we like to say, it's okay to not be okay. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, black people say, oh, really? Uh-huh. And see, I take it a step further. I say, it's okay not to be okay, but once you realize you're not okay, then you got to do something about it. It's on you right. to do something about it. Yeah, so so you put it on me now, mm-hmm. and I'm trying to juggle all this stuff that I got going on. All this stuff. What mm-hmm. am I, how, really? Yes. You think I can navigate this system? Because it's hard. It's and hard. I, like, and that's why like, that's why I, I honestly created chaos, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I look at things and I'm like, OK, y'all, you know, everybody's not going to go to therapy. Right. Everybody. I feel like everybody needed, but everybody's not going to go to therapy. And so how do you urbanize it? And so I'm grateful for the spaces that they have now where there's the podcast and there's the books and people got their TikTok therapies and, you know, all those TikTok different things. Therapy. Yes. And so people 
people are it's it's uh there's micro learning that's out there now okay. and so where people are getting things in doses mm-hmm. and so it's like we're planting the seeds there are people out there like me that we're planting the seeds and doing our best to give you the tools to nurture it until you can get in somewhere but i feel like we got to give you something you got to get something something because you can't keep out. You can't keep being out here just winging it on your own because that's not fair to you. Are you hopeful that we are on a path that we're not going to get off of? Yes, I am. I'm very hopeful. And, you know, you got people that are innovative like me that are in the back, back, back rooms and, and during these breaks where I'm supposed to be resting. I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to build apps so that we can mm. make sure that we, we have therapy at our fingertips and we are doing things where, um, you know, we are, are, are coming together as a collective. I think that the problem is, is that we're one, we are so committed to the book work of therapy that we don't get to the heart work of therapy. I think that's that. And I think that a lot of a lot of professionals have to recognize that you may be an expert in a certain field, but you will never be an expert on a person. They're the expert. Mm -hmm. You are the expert of yourself and you just go to a therapist to help you learn how to be the best version of you. But I think also, you know, we have to get past what traditional therapy looks like and we have to create spaces where we heal and grow together. So it's not just about the therapist. You come in and I'm telling you, no, what are we creating together? And I'm so grateful. COVID was a gift and a curse. You know, right. the the curse was we all know it, but the gift was it pulled back the curtain on mental health. Mm-hmm. And so then they started accepting teletherapy and so different right. things like that. And so if everything is at the palm of my hand, then I need to make sure that my mental is there as well. And so I feel we got to we have to be innovative in this. Us as mental health professionals have to be innovative and we have to work with the people just the same. We're we're clients as well as we are professionals and we have to wear both hats along with the clients and we got to create whatever this new wave of mental health and wellness looks like. One reason that I that I wanted to have you on was the was to talk about relationships, mm-hmm. right? And I've been married this year will be 30 years. Congratulations. Girl, thank you. Mm-hmm. It's a bad battle. Because it's work. It has See, still work. People always want the wedding, but they don't think about the marriage. Girl, I wanted the I wanted flowers. Uh-huh. I wanted, you know, you kiss me and I, you know, I, I wanted what I wanted yeah. and he wanted what he wanted. Right. And we've had to navigate all of that. Right. And but and it's figure a out what we want. Yes, mm-hmm. together. And yes. how how I, I he sent he posted this video, he didn't send it to me, but you know, learning how to be unhappy in a marriage. Yeah. If you can be unhappy for a minute, the woman said, mm-hmm. it, it, the marriage is not about being happy. It's not. And there's a book whose subtitle is, What If Marriage Was Meant to Make You Holy and Not Happy? Mm-hmm. Right? That's the subtitle. I don't even know what the title of the book I'm is. I'm going to have to look that up. That's real. Mm-hmm. Yes. That's deep. Mm-hmm. Yes. And so that that shook me because I went into marriage with all kind of preconceived notions. Yes, yes. You don't bring me flowers. <laughs> That's <laughs> real, yeah. You hardly talk to I mean, I mean, yes. when it's all these preconceived notions. But I wanted to talk to you about us in relationship. Mm-hmm. Because if we, if nothing else, we we need to be able to be in relationship with one another. And yes. whatever that means. Grandmother, grandkids, yes. with your aunties. Whatever the ship is. Whatever the ship is. Yes. But man and woman. Yes, and yes. That, and we, that's so hard. It is because we hurt our own feelings on an everyday basis mm. because we expect us out of other people. <laughs> Now, what's wrong with that? You know, it's, <laughs> because we are who we are based off of what we've been through, the experiences we've had and the people we've come into contact with. Right. But the people that we interact with don't have those same experiences. I do remember my husband saying, because we have been to couples counseling. Uh-huh. And um, I remember him saying at one point that he saying to the therapist, you know, at some point I just I felt like if she would just do just be what I said. Right. And how can she be there when she ain't you? I'm not you. And that's the and you're thing. not me. Facts, yeah, you know. Facts, and so yeah. that's the thing. Like, I I was married. I was in a relationship for 17 years, married for 13. And like my biggest thing, like I desire to be married again. But it is not about the marriage now. It is about me being the best version of me, meeting someone who's the best version of them, and we living our lives together. That is what it's about. 
It's about the journey. It's about understanding that you are are not. I have to accept you for you and you're going to grow and change. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm going to grow and change. But what I can do is provide this space for you to be able to be wholeheartedly you. And for you to provide that space for me to be wholeheartedly me. And that's what it looks like. But how do I, but providing that now this is, we've shifted into another level of therapy here. <laughs> how does one provide that space in everything we have just talked about? Mm -hmm. It's hard. It is, you know, but it is, if I'm going to allow you to be you, then that means that I am going to allow you to speak and that means that we're going to use assertive communication. I'm not going to be aggressive with you. I'm going to listen to understand. I'm going to understand that you may say some things that I don't agree with, but I allow your opinion to be your opinion. I am not going to I'm not going to throw things back at you when you say things to me. So that means that I'm going to be a safe space. I'm not going to use your hardships against you mm -hmm. when it may be something for me. I'm not going to be manipulative in the situation, which we can be. Yes. I'm not going to try to force my thoughts and opinions on yours. And one thing, I will love you. And sometimes me loving you means that you're not going to be with me. And that's facts. And that's unconditional love. That means I love you and I want you to be happy, even if that means it's not with me. So that's that free flowing, that agape love. Mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm, something mm -hmm. that we on. We always want to love selfishly, and we want to love within. You have to do this. Well, no, I tell people all the time. I want you to be you, wholeheartedly. But you do have to understand that for you to be you wholeheartedly, there are some things that you can do that you can't do with me, and I have a choice as well. Right. But you have to be willing to have those conversations, have those choices, have those deal breakers and discuss those deal breakers and then not get mad at people when they show you that they may not have the capacity to be who you want and or need them because to be. Because people cannot give what they did not Baby, get. I can only give you what I got to give. I mm -hmm. say that about my mother. I say it all the time, like when there was a part of me forgiving, my mother broke me because she was broken, too. She can only give me what she had to give. Mm -hmm. And in some areas, that was her brokenness. Is it safe to say, I hope, mm -hmm. that we as black people, we do want to be in healthy relationships yes. because society has tried to give us a sense of ourselves. And this is what we one thing we're doing here mm -hmm. at List in St. Louis with mm -hmm. Carol Daniel is changing the narrative, as yes. I mentioned. Yes. Change the story we tell ourselves yes. about ourselves. Yes. And so, part of that story has been told to us. Yes. And we have to we have to we have to write the narratives mm -hmm. because it doesn't look same it doesn't look the same for everybody. And that's the thing. And so when you are in relationship with somebody, what you create with that person is what y'all create together. We got to stop policing other people's relationships and we got to stop policing other people. And that's just being real. You know, we have to be open. We have to flow and we don't be willing to flow because we want to control everything. And that's where the problem, the problem comes in the control. That's where it comes in. It doesn't come where we take ownership for our part in it. So is that because I think I'm again, how did this become a therapy session for me? That was not <laughs> my intention at all. But we are controlling, but we don't know that we're controlling. Oftentimes we don't. And so, you know, um, and, and isn't that something that that one may do in order to. You control the environment. So is that the fighters? It response? could be a trauma response. The trauma response. Yes, because I'm yeah. trying to control this. Because if I can control then control this, then I can control the impact. Yeah, that's the biggest thing. But in life, you're gonna you're gonna hurt. In life, we we can't run from pain. We can't run from change. We can't run from those experiences. We can't because it's a part of life. But we have to figure out how to go through it. That's it. Candace, sometimes I, I, I was at an event last year and I just remember looking around the room and it was and it was a black uh, an event f featuring supporting mm -hmm. um, black success and achievement. Mm -hmm. Right. I'll just put it that way. And I remember looking around the room and thinking we can be we're beautiful. Yes, we are. 
right? We are beautiful. But I'm one, I've always walked in the room and I wanted to know, what is your story? And that's mm-hmm. a journalist in me. Yes. What? Because everybody has a story. Everybody does. And we rise to the beauty of it. Mm-hmm. Like we, the lashes, the hair, the slits, the we got it all going on. Mm-hmm. And I'm still wondering, there's brokenness in this entire room. I know there is. And, and that's my thing. So like when I meet people, my thought process is when I meet somebody it's always what am I supposed to get and or give right in this situation mm-hmm. that's how I meet people because mm-hmm. I'm like okay it's, I'm supposed to learn something from you or I'm supposed to give you something or maybe it's supposed to be an interchange of something and I think that if we went to people and we we got past the what is wrong and we start really looking at what happened we can start seeing people with our hearts and not our eyes. Right. And because when you see people with your eyes, you filter them through your stained glass windows. Mm. So you filter them through your experiences. So you start telling yourself your story about their story before they even get a chance to tell you who they actually are. But we're look. I feel like, but also we're looking in the mirror. Very much so. That's that's what and when and, I looked around that room. Yes, and that and oftentimes we don't want to see what's in the mirror. And so we fight it, or, or we put lashes on it. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, we dress it up all yeah, the time. Totally dress but which it is up. which is a which is another part of 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 fleeing, because I dress it up. You know what I'm saying? It's avoidance. And so, like I think I, I've 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 met people that you got they got the prettiest houses, the nicest cars, the the everything. But then, like that's why they say like oftentimes the saying where they say like the prettiest women have the ugliest souls. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Right. So it's like you got all of this on the outside, but all of it is is a mask to who you actually are. And so I tell people all the time, before you get into a relationship with somebody else, I need you to get into a relationship with you. Because how can you expect for somebody to want to be around you when you don't even want to be around you? Candace, we know that depression, we know that suicidal ideation, we know that anxiety and you mentioned it, the the covers were pulled back during mm-hmm. the pandemic. We know all those things are at an all-time high. Yes. We just measured. Mm-hmm. May not Because we're not talking slavery. But yes. those things are at an all-time high in the black community right now. So mm-hmm. be, be, before we leave, um, you, you said you're hopeful. Mm-hmm. But we are looking at a lack of mental well-being at an all-time high, mm-hmm. especially among young black boys and girls. Mm-hmm. I think that the biggest thing, like what I'm, what makes me hopeful is these days, these kids are still a little more aware than others were. There are the, I just, I just trained a, a group of chaos ambassadors at uh, Kirkwood High School. And so it's a group of kids where I just taught them the chaos mindset, what these different things are. So now they can start changing the narratives between their friends. When somebody got an attitude or thinking somebody is against them, they can say, well, maybe something happened to them. Mm -hmm. Let's look at something different. I think that we have to continue to start changing these conversations. I think that we as the adults, we have to start dealing with our own stuff, our own stuff. So therefore we can be safe spaces for these children. Mm -hmm. And I think that is some stuff that got to happen politically. You know what I'm saying? For us, uh, you know, in regard to like changing some things some lobbying, some things, creating, you know, health care where things are free, you know, in certain areas and not just not just Medicaid, like just other things need to be offered. Just like they got EAP for jobs. We should have that type of stuff set up inside of schools. You know, just if you teach physical health in school, you should teach mental health in school. Just different things like that. We we have to stop just talking about it being something we need to do and actually put more things into action. And those that are doing the work, we got to start working together instead of working in silos. Chaos is what again? Chaos is keep healing and overcoming struggles. Keep healing and overcoming struggles. Dr. Candace Cox, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure. I appreciate you. Definitely. So what we want you to do really with this conversation is to share it. So many nuggets. I can't. Everything she said um, was a nugget to improve your life. And you are maybe you're broken. Mm -hmm. Things did happen. Mm -hmm. But you can do something about it. Yes, definitely. You I'll say this. You know what it feels like to hurt and hold on. You deserve to know what it feels like to heal and move forward. You owe that to you. Well said. Well said. Subscribe. 
And please share this video. And if you are in a situation right now where you don't feel safe, um, 988 is the number to call. It's 988. And someone will answer. Someone will definitely answer the phone and walk you through what is going on in your life right now. You are not alone. There are people who are ready to help you. And you can and deserve healing and to be in a safe place place. You deserve that. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate you. Go to 9pbs.org for all of our previous podcasts. There's all kinds of good information, all kinds of great stories about what we are doing and who we are in St. Louis. We thank you so much for joining us, and we'll be back next week with another episode of Listen St. Louis with Carol Daniel. Thank you. Be well. For information about 9PBS's Mental Wellbeing Initiative, visit 9PBS.org slash mental wellbeing. Listen St. Louis with Carol Daniel is supported in part by Midwest Bank Center, the Betsy and Thomas Patterson Foundation, and Orvin and Latrice Kimbrough.